<laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Come right there, my friend. Thank you. Okay. So today, today we're going to start getting into. We're going to start getting into the real nuts and bolts of how the universe works. We're going to start talking about not just chemistry as a practice of looking at things and observing things, but really we're going to do, we're going to present the findings of chemistry, all right? Which is to say this, oh, did I forget to change the header? See, this is annoying. I always use previous notes as the template for my next one, and every once in a while I forget to change the header on it, and it makes me feel crazy. So that should say that. Sorry about that. But see, you know what that is? Uh, yeah, but it, but that's on every page. See, that is amateur hour. That's just straight up, straight up incompetence on my part. And maybe it makes you feel furious. Maybe that makes you feel furious. I don't know, but I'll tell you, it sure makes me feel furious. I hate, there's nothing I hate more than amateur hour. Um, anyway, okay. So we want to go on, and here's the thing. You're going to see that today's lesson involves over 2,000 years of people figuring things out and thinking things. So, so this obviously involves a lot of compression of thought, all right? You could do, you could spend your whole life studying, the, and people have, studying just the history of how we got to where we are now with our understanding of science. So this is by no means exhaustive. Also, and I always feel the need to mention this, uh, we, we live in a very like sexist white male world. So you're gonna discover that this lesson is like a history of what white men have done. Um, no, seriously, and th this bears mentioning because, because we, this is the product of a few things. The first is, uh, you know, like 3,000 years ago, people in Eastern cultures would figure things out. And then when we figured it out, like in the 1600s, we're like, hey, look what we discovered. Yay, white guys. And everyone's like, yeah, that guy's a genius. Geez, I can't believe that he figured that out 2,000 years after those other people over there figured it out. <laughs> like, yeah, yay for us. Um, and then who gets printed in the textbook? The white guy. Yeah, it's good to be a white man. You can come to the party like way later and you're the first one there. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, so I just, I just, I feel the need to mention that. And that's not to, it's not to say anything except to say, if we were really to dig into the history of science, it looks a lot more colorful and it looks a lot more gender diverse. And unfortunately, like the grade nine textbook version of what the history of science looks like, looks a lot like this. Um, you're welcome. So, having said that, uh, we'll start with somebody we already talked about. We talked about this fellow. Now, I don't know if we saw this fellow before. This, my friends, uh, is our pal Democritus. Um, now, if you remember, Democritus had the idea that if we took a block of some kind of metal, you don't have to draw this, and we cut it in half, and then we cut it in half again. I'm doing my best. And then we cut it in half again. No, you don't have to copy this. Eventually, eventually we get to something that we can't cut. This is a thought experiment. Did he actually sit there and cut things down to tiny microscopic sizes? No. He's just performing a thought experiment. But he comes up with the idea of the atom. It comes from the Greek word atomus, which means indivisible. Yeah, this you can write. So something makes sense it's not it's not where it comes from so our word atom 
Our word atom comes from the Greek word atomus, which means indivisible. And the idea of the atom, it is the unit particle. of matter. Sorry, Democritus, I'm crowding out your photo here. So, so this is his idea. Now, he has no empirical evidence to back this up, but he has a few other things to say about it. Shh. He says that, like, shh. each substance has its own particles. So his basic idea is that gold would be made of gold particles. Water would be made of water particles, atoms. Uh, that hydrogen would be made of hydrogen atoms. So they didn't know about hydrogen. You get the idea. And different atoms have different weights. Why do you think that? Why would he think that different atoms have different weights? I mean, it's interesting that he was right about that, but why would he think that? Yeah, and that's exactly right. So you talked about this the other day when you talked about density, right? Which is if I take a piece of foam the size of a gold bar, it's very light, right? If I take an actual gold bar, same size, it's very heavy. They have different densities, right? If you ever watch like these behind the scenes making of like a Hollywood special, uh, you know, they will have like a real sword that's been carefully built by a guy like working in a blacksmith shop on his belt the whole time. And then in the scene where he actually swings it at a guy and like hits him in the neck, they use one made of foam rubber, right? So it's nice and light. Um, you can actually sometimes, are you looking to calculate this? Yeah. Right on the caddy. Doesn't so his thinking is, that if things can be the same size but different weights, their particles must have different weights. And empty space just had no particles. Which, by the way, to this guy, what would empty space include? Yeah, right? In his mind, the air was also just empty space. So there he is, our pal Democritus, does a thought experiment and comes up with the right idea. The problem with the right idea is this. The problem with the right idea is this. Without evidence to back up the right idea, your right idea is no more compelling than the wrong idea. People don't believe you more. Listen, there is alive and well today an active flat earth society. Oh my God. Yeah, no, there are. <laughs> see? See? But listen. Shh. Listen. And people will come up with crazy explanations for why they must be right about that. And unless you can present evidence, you can't convince people. Now, here's the sad truth. Shh. You can also present people with you can also present people with a lot of evidence and they will still believe what they want to believe because people and this is all of us this is me this is you this is important to remember we're really stupid <laughs> now listen all of us all of us and and here's the scary part the more educated you are the more in danger of being really stupid you are this is true, because when you're really well-educated, you start to think, I know a lot. Look at me. I know so much stuff, um, and I'm good at knowing things, and the things I know, they're, they're all right. And you know those things I think? I pretty much know them too, right? So that's probably all right too. And that stuff I've kind of thought a little bit about, I mean, I've only thought a little bit, but I'm, I'm really good at being right, so that stuff's probably all right too, right? So listen. There's nothing more dangerous than a little bit of knowledge. It's a dangerous, dangerous thing. 
that is yeah away thank you um so we have democritus and he has his ideas but without evidence another guy comes along and he has a different idea we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because he was dead wrong but aristotle believed what everything is what's spot when sky Here's what he believed. He believed that everything is made up of some combination of earth, wind, water, and fire. And here's what he says. He says, like, you look at a log, and a log looks like it's just a log, but really, um, you can dehydrate it, so it's got water in it. If I burn it, it turns into ash, which is just soil. That's just earth. Um, if I burn it, I see the fire, right? And smoke comes off it, which is wind. So his idea is that everything is composed of some combination of this stuff. In an absence of evidence, that makes as much sense as anything else, right? So Aristotle has this idea, and this idea dominates for 2,000 years. He did not live for 2,000 years, but his idea did. His idea dominated for 2,000 years because nobody could prove him wrong. He was a well-respected philosopher. Now, we shouldn't say that's the only idea people had over that time, but for 2,000 years, this was by and large what people thought was the best guess, the best idea. Because in the end, in the end, if you want to disprove something, you have to have proof. And for 2,000 years, we just didn't have any instrumentation, any technology that would let us look small enough into nature to know what it is. So it's not that people in the past were stupid at all. People in the past did amazing things. It's that we were asking them to understand something that was just too small for them to look at. Does that make sense? And so it's not that they, by the way, went around like obsessing with this idea. They probably mostly just didn't think about it. Right? They said, oh yeah, that, that guy, he's got that idea. That's as good as anything. When we started to develop technology, that would let us look at these things, we started to come along. So first I want to introduce you to the idea of a guy named John Dalton. John Dalton. And he revived the idea of atomism. And here's why. Here's what he found. Shh. Dalton figured this out. He worked with gases. And what he found out was this, that he could make water. He could make water, shh, not get water, not get water out of the tap, but he could make water. What two things would he have to react if he was going to make water? No, what two things? What two? Yeah, so here's what he discovered. He discovered that if he took hydrogen gas and added it to oxygen gas, he could get hydrogen and oxygen stuck together. By the way, you're going to look and say, like, isn't water H2O? Yeah, we know that now. Did he know that then? No. No. So this is what he knew. But here's what was interesting. He always found out that it took roughly, if he took, like, one pound of hydrogen and about eight pounds of oxygen, he could make nine pounds of water. Now that just makes sense, right? The masses come together, but here's what he found out. Shh. If he kept the oxygen the same, and he made this seven pounds, he would still only make nine pounds of water, and what would be left over? Six pounds of hydrogen. What he discovered was that it was always a ratio. For every one pound of hydrogen, he needed eight pounds of oxygen. Does that make sense? So water isn't, water isn't just some hydrogen mixed with some oxygen. Rather, 
he discovered that fixed amounts or fixed ratios fixed ratios of gases reacted. And he came up with the idea that oxygen must just be eight times heavier than hydrogen. Right? That really what's happening here is that every one hydrogen thing, particle, piece, can react with one oxygen piece. And the oxygen ones must just be heavier. And this goes back to what Democritus did. He said, what if everything was made of individual particles and they were different weights? Now, Dalton isn't quite right because we now know that it's actually not one hydrogen and one oxygen. We know that it's two hydrogens and one oxygen. But for his time, this is a big step forward. Does that make sense? If the weights are always fixed, if one is always eight times heavier than the other, and that's what always works, the idea came forward that they must be made of particles of different weights. So the gases must be made of particles with fixed weights. So basically he finds that oxygen always weighs the same, hydrogen always weighs the same. And he starts studying other gases and he discovers that they all weigh specific things every time and those weights are always different. Different from one another, but always consistent within. Oxygen always weighs the same as oxygen, and it always weighs differently than hydrogen. <coughs> and so he basically comes up with what we call the billiard ball model. So, by the way, I just put a little drawing of his idea here, basically. He basically thought one atom of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen came together to make a compound, a particle of water. And even though he got the specifics wrong, his theory is right, right? He's got the idea right, even if he doesn't quite have the details worked out. Oh, I did get an email. Um, so his model of the atom is basically this. He imagines every atom as a sphere and different sizes and weights. And that these things sometimes like to stick together. You put hydrogen and oxygen together, they'll stick together. And they'll make water. So our model of the atom is just a sphere. It's pretty boring. So here we go. Now, um, I want to show you what the next discovery looked like. And unfortunately, I don't have quite the right apparatus to show you the whole thing. Um, but I've got an apparatus that can at least show you half of it. Um, now, this, this is a death trap because uh, it's got a voltage transformer that takes the 120 volt line level coming out of the walls and pumps it up to 20,000 volts. Um, but don't worry, because for safety, it's just got the metal electrodes completely exposed. This thing terrifies me. I am terrified of it. Well, because I want to show you something. All of which is to say this, do not mess with this. Okay, don't come back here and play with it. It really could kill you pretty easily. And I'm going to try to have it not kill me. But if it has to kill one of us, you're much younger, you've got your whole life ahead of you. So I'll take I'll take the fall. But rather ideally, none of us. Yes, sir. Like take a picture. <laughs> like a selfie, right? Like use the front camera and get like you in the front, me in the back. Uh, like, I don't know. Like call 911 for God's sake. Because then we get the lights on. Okay, so this next discovery was by a guy named J.J. Thompson. And he didn't invent the device I'm going to talk to you about. Um, 
He used something called a Crooks tube, which is similar to this. The only difference between this and Crooks tube, and I wish I had one, but we don't have one here, is that instead of being narrow like this, Crooks tube widens out. So it's the same basic setup as this. And you can fill it with a gas. You can fill it with any gas you wanted, or you could evacuate it and use just a vacuum. The version he used was evacuated and had a vacuum in it, so no air in it. So it's a little bit different, but the principle is the same, which is if you take, in this case it's a gas, but in his case it was metal on each end, two electrodes, and you pump up lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of electrical potential between them, you plug them into a really high voltage source, even though there's nothing between them, you can actually get something to go to prove them. And it looks a little like this. Why should we hate this thing? There we go. Okay, so there it is. So you can actually see a beam of light. Now, a beam of light is nothing terribly exciting, it's just light, right? There's lots of ways to make a beam of light. Even in those days, you could you can just take the sunlight coming through a window and put it through, you know, through a lens and you can get a beam of light. You could burn something and get a beam of light. Here's what makes this interesting. And here's what he discovered. This beam of light weighs something. Now, does light weigh something? As the sun shines down on you, is it pushing you down with its weight? No. But this light, this light has mass. And he could prove it because he could put a magnet up to that beam of light. And again, this isn't the right setup for it, so I can't show you. So if I find one later in the week, I'm trying to borrow one, I will show you. He could put a magnet up to it, and the beam of light would move towards the magnet. And if you put the other pole of the magnet there, the beam of light would move away from the magnet. And in fact, they already knew roughly, roughly, the speed of light at this point. So he could actually, using the speed of light and how much the stuff turned based on the magnet, he could actually figure out how much the things in there weighed. And they were really, really, really light. Lighter than any atom. There was something in there really, really light. And then he was able to do something else, which is he could take an electrical source and put it next to it. And he found that not only did it have mass, but it had an electrical charge, which makes sense, right? We're plugging electricity through it. So he discovered that there's something in here moving, that's tiny, but has mass, and has an electrical charge. And when I stop the electricity, gone. There, not there. So can someone get the lights? So, now, if I did that experiment, if I did that experiment, I imagine I would look and say, well, that was shiny, pretty cool, and then I'd go eat bacon. But J.J. Thompson, which is this fellow, all right, he performed an experiment. Folks. The, the device he used was called a Crooks tube. Crooks tube. And there's a diagram of it below. And the long and the short of it is that it produced this, in this case, green light that he could move with a charged plate. So he found evidence of tiny, smaller than an atom, negatively charged particles. Now, there's a problem here. There's a big problem here.
What's the problem? Smaller than an atom. What did Democritus tell us an atom was? No, Democritus. He said that the atom was when you cut something in half and cut in half and cut in half, the atom is what happens when it's so small it can't be cut anymore. And yet, what's this? Smaller than an atom. This is the point where I would have said, I'm going to need some bacon and to stop thinking right now. But again, Thompson, being of studier stuff than I am, he came up with an idea. He came up with an idea that said, an atom must be made of different things. The atom itself must be made of different particles. Now, the atom overall has no charge, and you know this. If I touch this desk, I am not electrocuted and killed by the negatively charged electrons in it. So atoms do not have a charge overall, but when we give them a bit of energy, the negative bits that are in them spit out. And they're these tiny little things he discovered. So he discovered these little particles. He called these electrons. We still use that word today. And he comes up with an idea. He says, OK, we know that atoms are spheres. Because who told us that atoms are spheres? Last page, who's the guy who told us? Yeah, who is that white guy who told us atoms are spheres? What was it? Yeah, John Dalton. So John Dalton told us that an atom is a sphere. So here's what he comes up with. He says, OK, wait a minute. I know that inside that atom, there must be tiny little negatively charged particles that I can kick out with a bit of energy. So inside of this, there are these little negatively charged particles. And we call these electrons. The stuffed inside this thing, like that. And then, if those are negative, what must the big blue thing be? If those are all negative, and overall the thing has no charge, what must cancel those negative charges out? A positive charge. So his idea is that we have this positively charged atom. And then we have the negatively charged bits of the atom. And he called the negatively charged bits the electrons of the atom. And he basically said that under normal circumstances, they live there together, they cancel each other out. But if you give that atom a lot of electricity, a lot of energy, it can take those negatively charged bits and they can come flying in. And that's what we see flying across the tube there. Does that kind of make sense? Cool. So this is Thompson's model. And he suggests that it looks like, does anyone have British family? Does anyone know what the British call all desserts? Like the dessert course of meal, they call. Does anyone know this? It's weird. Orlando? Speaking. Yep. Thanks. You're welcome. That's embarrassing. <laughs> um, anyway, they call all desserts pudding. Like when we say pudding, we mean like that stuff you get in like the plastic thing, right? But like if they make. If they make like a dessert casserole or they make like uh, like muffins or anything like that, they call it pudding. So they called this the plum pudding model. But more often than that, that, that sounds weird to us because when we hear pudding, we imagine like a goopy liquid, right? So, and by the way, he never used this word. 
this was a phrase that a newspaper used to kind of describe what he was thinking of. But really, you can think of it, if we're going to make that a modern day analogy, you could think of it as the blueberry muffin model of the atom. <laughs> Seriously. Shh. Yeah. So here's the basic idea. He imagines that the atom is made up of a big, soft thing. And it's positively charged. And then stuck in it are these little, little negatively charged things, kind of like blueberries. And you could picture it as being like a muffin. Now, it's a perfectly spherical muffin, which, by the way, if you could figure out how to bake that, that would be a really cool business. And I bet you'd do well. Imagine that being like a perfectly spherical muffin. That would be right? So, shh. That is, that is your food science challenge for the day. But, shh. So, I just want to slow down and just take a look here with me, if you will. We go from the pure idea, the pure idea that if we cut something in half, eventually we'll get to something we can't cut in half. And then eventually, we get somebody, John Dalton, who has some evidence for that. Where Dalton discovers that, that things react What? That things react in fixed proportions. In fixed proportions. That hydrogen and oxygen come together to make water, and it's always in fixed weights. The oxygen always weighs eight times as much as the hydrogen. And he says, this only makes sense. It only makes sense that it would work that way if those actually little oxygen particles, little oxygen atoms, and little hydrogen atoms that always stick together, and because I know that there's always eight times as much oxygen as hydrogen by weight, those oxygen atoms must be eight times heavier. And again, he was almost right. He was almost right. Chemi yeah, chemists would come forward a little bit later and see that it's a little bit more complex than that, but not much. He's on the right track. And so he says, well, these things are basically just spheres floating around and they can stick together. Sometimes the models at the time would even show these with little hooks on them, suggesting how they would stick together. Kind of silly, right? But the idea was, well, how do you get two spheres to stick to each other? Well, you put a hook on it. Yeah. <laughs> These are all, and this is important to remember, everything you're going to learn in chemistry and physics is all a model. We cannot actually get down and see what atoms look like. But we know how they behave. So we build models to explain how they behave. And as we learn more, our models get more complicated. So this model, it's pretty basic, right? Spheres with hooks stuck in them, sticking together. Shh. But it did a good job explaining what Dalton discovered. Now, along comes rather Thompson, rather, and Thompson discovers that and Thompson discovers that there are these little bits inside the atom that we can get to be released. And they're tiny, much, much, much smaller than the atom, and they have a negative charge. And to explain that, he has to come up with a new model of the atom. So being a very creative guy, he says, well, the sphere must have been right, but it's got these little negative bits in it. And since the whole thing is neutral, if the little bits are negative, the whole thing must be Positive, because that cancels out. Does that make sense? A positive and a negative cancel out to make nothing. <clears throat> the last one we're going to talk about today. The last one we're going to talk about today <laughs> is this fine fellow here. Nucleus. Whoa. Whoa. Awesome. All right. <laughs> this... Uh, <laughs> This is our pal Ernest Rutherford. I like to think that Ernest Rutherford's mustache discovered this and that Ernest Rutherford was just along for the ride. So, shh. in 1909, 
1909, Rutherford worked with, now this is aluminum foil, he worked with something even more, hey, what is the property of matter that lets you flatten it out to a thin sheet? Um, what property of matter tells you? Malleable. Okay. So a metal that's malleable can be flattened out into a sheet. Now, aluminum can be flattened into an awfully thin sheet. Gold is even more malleable than aluminum. In fact, often, you ever see a building... Like Trump Tower or something, everything's co everything's gold. It's not solid gold. Usually, it's gold leaf. Often, especially in history, what they would do is they build something out of wood because wood is easy to sculpt and this or that. And then they would pound gold until it was very, very, very thin, and just put a little bit of an adhesive on the wood, and you can lay the gold over it, and you now have gold leaf, gold covered something. And gold super thinness lets you do that. So. They were studying gold leaf. And in the interim, they had discovered a new particle. So they knew about, you remember we learned about the electron, little tiny particles. Well, we had in the interim discovered a new particle called an alpha particle. That is the Greek letter alpha. That it's alpha. Yes. Backwards. Can a fish go either way? Anyway, that's an alpha. So we had discovered alpha particles. They were smaller than atoms. But heavy. So the alpha particle is as small as an at is much, much, much smaller than an atom but is as heavy as an atom. And here's what Rutherford did. He he had an emitter here that could shoot out a stream of alpha particles. All right, so it would spit out a stream of alpha particles like this. And along their path, he put a piece of gold foil. And what do you think he predicted would happen when these hit? Remember that these are much smaller than an atom, much, 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 much smaller than an atom, but as heavy as an atom. And they're moving very fast. So I want you to picture this. And this is, this is kind of a dark metaphor, but it's the same idea. What, what is something relatively heavy but small that we move very fast uh, in modern think? Yeah, it's like a bullet, right? A bullet is relatively heavy, but it's very small and fast moving. Now, not to get too graphic, but if we shoot a bullet at something that weighs the same as the bullet, but is as big as we are, we expect the bullet to do what? So imagine if, what would weigh the same as bullet, like foam, like really loose foam, right? If we had like a cardboard cutout the size of a person made of foam, and we shot a bullet at it, we would expect what to happen? You'd expect it to go right through. Does that make sense? So here's what he expected. He expected to have oh, he expected to have an atom like this. Remember the atom is positively charged. Shh. And what is stuck in all around the positively charged atom? Negatively charged electrons, like a blueberry muffin just scattered all around. And he thought 
that these particles, I'm going to draw the arrows after, would just shoot right through. The thinking being that the atom was much, much, much less dense. So he expected that they would just shoot right through. And he set up a detector, which was just a piece of fluorescent screen. It was just a screen where when those alpha particles hit it, they would glow a little bit. So he looked and he saw, sure enough, where was, it gl where was the glow happening? There. Except, except every once in a while, except every once in a while, it wouldn't. Every once in a while, the beam would deflect just for a split second, and you'd get a shot somewhere else. So he shot alpha particles through gold foil. expecting them to pass straight through. In fact, that's a little bit of a simplification. He had, in fact, done the math, and he thought that they would be deflected about a quarter of a degree. He was expecting a tiny little deflection, just a little change in direction. Um, because even if you shot a bullet through something that was just foam, that might change the path of the bullet a little bit. Does that make sense? Is foam rubber going to make a bullet ricochet back toward the shooter? No. But it, could it change its course so it moves a little bit like this if you hit it at a certain angle? So that's the math he does. He's expecting that. But what he finds instead, instead, some particles... deflected by large angles. And the thing is, Rutherford is very good at math. He can do the math. And he says, if an atom is the size we know it is, and that came from previous scientists, and these alpha particles are much, much smaller but weigh the same, that can't happen. It cannot happen that they would hit and bounce back. Yes. Yep. So, he comes up with an idea, and he says, what if it isn't a muffin with electrons embedded in it? What if the atom looks like this? I'm going to leave it alone. Shh. Well, eventually, what I want to show is this. Shh. Yeah, you can draw this. What if the positively charged bit is there, and what if the negatively charged bits are just kind of floating around here? We won't worry about where, but they're so light they don't even matter. And basically he says this. If this alpha particle flies through, it just goes straight. If this alpha particle flies through, it just goes straight. If this one flies through, it just goes straight. But this one hits here. What's it going to do? Now, this thing is tiny and heavy, heavier than the alpha particle. What's going to happen to it? It's going to reflect at an angle. Yeah. Purple are the alpha particles. So what he basically comes up with the idea is this. If the heavy part of the atom, sorry, was actually tiny, most of the alpha particles would just miss it, so they'd go straight through. But if it did hit it, now it would be heavy enough to make those alpha particles ricochet. Does that make sense? If I put a thin steel pole there that was incredibly dense, and I shot bullets at it, most of my bullets would just miss. They'd go straight by, right? But the ones that did hit that steel pole, what would they do? 
in Ricochet. Does that make sense? And from that, Rutherford draws the conclusion that the atom must look like this. It must have a heavy positive center. And he calls this, and this might be a word you know. He calls this the nucleus. And then, if that is small, what makes the atom big like we know it is? Well, he says that the electrons must orbit around it, like a planet. You obviously don't have to draw that as big as I did. And then the negatively charged electrons orbit. And remember that they are very light. So all the heavy part of the atom is stuck down in the middle. Have I? Uh, focus. All right. That was my mean face. I don't know if you recognize it. I'm pretty mean. It's one of the first things people notice, but very mean, very tough. Yes. The electron is so light, the alpha particle would just shove it aside. Yeah, the electrons are not heavy enough to interfere with them at all. When we get to tomorrow, the specifics, we'll talk about just how light an electron is. But the long and the short of it is, it's very, very light. Yes, ma'am. Oh, OK, no problem. So tomorrow, uh, we'll take about five minutes more in Orlando time, which means 37 minutes more, um, to talk about the final conclusions we drew. But listen, I want to I wanna stress this. This is like this is like you know on Netflix how they give you like the one sentence version of a movie like in the description to like make you want to watch it right and it'll just say like the world changed when the a young man discovers attack. he has magical force powers and goes on a journey with an old man to rescue a princess and you're like oh. That sounds interesting. I'll watch that. Um, so listen. Um, in terms of chemistry, that's all this lesson has time to be. Does that make sense? We are taking hundreds of years of intense research by millions of people, literally, and distilling it down to like one note's worth of discoveries. Yeah, which is which is problematic. Which is problematic. I don't have a better way to do it um, because I don't think you guys would appreciate it if I spent the next six months of your lives teaching you about the history of chemistry. Um, I mean, listen. I'm very interesting, so obviously you love it. But you know, there's other stuff I have to teach you. Um, so here's what I want to say. One of the takeaways is this, and I hope that this, maybe this is the best way to see that, that you guys have yet come into contact with, which is that science is the art of asking questions about the world, performing experiments, gathering evidence, and then updating our thinking. So what I like about this lesson is that we go from a totally wrong idea, earth, wind, fire, air, um, which is just dead wrong, or water, um, and from that totally wrong idea, somebody makes a discovery. Oh, hey, when I react gases in certain ways, it's, it's always fixed amounts that come together. And from that he goes, okay, there must be indivisible particles. This guy Aristotle must have been wrong. That guy Democritus, who everybody said was wrong, he must have been right. So they go back and look at that and he says, yeah, there must be these spheres. And we know they can stick together to make things, so they must have little hooks on them. Right? 
Like you're talking really, really, really simple stuff, right? But gets the ball rolling. And science is this. Science happens when the next guy comes along and says, well, wait a minute. I just found something smaller than that sphere coming out of that sphere. What does that mean? And it had a negative charge. So they go back and look and say, okay, you must have these spheres. They must be positively charged. And it must have these little negatively charged bits in them. That is, that's updating a theory. And that's what science does all the time. We find new evidence about the universe around us, and we change our theory to address that. Does that make sense? And we're still doing that today. Uh, you know, billions of dollars have been spent uh, at CERN in Switzerland under Geneva to build something called the Large Hadron Collider. Anyone ever heard of that? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I don't think that we're really all that worried about a black hole, but listen, shh. So, shh. Like, if you look, this is a device that we have built that goes around an entire city underground. Shh. Guys, if you take up my time, I'll take up yours. It's up to you, but I'd rather not, but I will. Even today, even today, we're spending billions of dollars to build a device where we can take small particles and bash them into each other to see if we can make new particles nobody's seen yet. And we're going to talk a bit more about this as we go along, but that continues. And what they are trying to do at CERN, and this is what makes scientists scientists, this is so key is what they are trying to do at CERN is they're trying to find a particle that breaks our theory. That's the essence of science. What they're trying to do every day is make something happen that we can't explain. Because when they find something that we can't explain, that means that our theory isn't good enough. And that thing we found that we can't explain, as we figure out how to explain it, that will bring forward the next theory. That makes sense? So people often ask, and I don't, we're not going to get into this today, but people often ask about like sort of the nexus between science and religion. And I will go on record as saying I don't think there has to be any conflict between scientific belief and religious belief. I don't think there's any reason they can't live in harmony, provided that you approach both with an open mind and reason. In other words, if you believe that an all-powerful God who is logical made the universe, it shouldn't then surprise you that you can look at the universe and learn things about it. That seems to make sense to me. Um, having said that, not everyone believes that the universe is made by an all-powerful being, but that's not really what science is about. It's not about that in a positive way or a negative way. It just isn't that. It's the study of that universe. So if you believe in a God who created it, then science is the study of creation. But what, what distinguishes science from faith is that the goal of science is always to find something telling us we're wrong. That's when learning happens. Does that make sense? We learn something when, like J.J. Thompson, we do an experiment and it shows us something that should be impossible. We said, oh, the atom's the smallest, lightest thing in the universe. And then we do an experiment that shows us something smaller and lighter than an atom. Right? That breaks our theory. That tells us our theory is wrong, which to a scientist isn't something to be discouraged about or disappointed about. That's what science is. It's being told you're wrong and then figuring out how do we fix it. Just wait, sis. Sit. Sit. Okay, I told you, you take my time, I take yours. So, um, thank you. Okay, you can wait for me to dismiss you. Two more things. Thing the first. Just going to take longer. Thing the first, um, if you missed lab on Thursday, you will not have enough time in class in order to finish it, so you need to catch up with me, talk to me, we'll decide when you're doing it. 
that in the second, um, if you were here at the lab on Thursday, you will have a chance to do the one station we did tomorrow, at which point I will want the write-up for that from each individual on Wednesday of this week. So if you're here Thursday, your lab report will be due Wednesday. Oh, oh, thank you. You may be dismissed. Have a good day. Be kind to one another. Sure, like, no. Is it okay if I do the lab Tuesday at lunch? That'd be great. Thank you. I will print one now so you can get me later in the day if you want, or you can just get tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, with that. So